Hello, today we're going to be looking at this question on trade unions, something that seems likely given it hasn't been tested recently and it is also quite current. Um, so evaluate the microeconomic effects of trade unions in an industry of your choice. So the important thing here is to choose your industry. Today we're going to be looking at the train industry and we could also change this question to a uh, paper three essay, evaluate the microeconomic and macroeconomic effects of trade unions in an industry of your choice. So uh, we're going to take this both ways today. So our first uh, point is going to be that a trade union uses collective bargaining in order to improve working conditions and wages. With those two diagrams there, see what you can think of as to the effects and the points that you're going to write about uh, in the next two points and what your evaluations might be. OK, so our first point coming back is going to be using that left hand diagram, uh, the cost revenue and profit diagram to uh, show the effect on the train company. And here we have chosen southeastern train journeys. A really important technique for your application in this essay is to choose a very specific good, a specific industry and make sure that that's on the axis. So I've got train drivers on the axis here and I've got southeastern on the other uh, axis as well. So effect on the train company, well, it's important to go through each of part of your diagram. You start off at MC equals MR, or even I should say MC1 equals MR. And you want to then say what your quantity is, how many train journeys are being used. That's Q1. Uh, you've got the price of P1 and P1 ABC1 of supernormal profit, which is quite significant. Then as the cost of labor rises, we assume that variable costs rise. Marginal costs and average costs both shift upwards to MC2 and AC2 and you have a new equilibrium point where or a profit maximizing point where MC2 equals MR and Q2 quantity of train journeys a lower quantity of train journeys are now bought and sold at a price of P2 and you have P2 EFC2 of, cons of uh, new profit and your profit has fallen as a result to this smaller area here. And as a result, you could then take that further. Always good to extend your logical chain of reasoning by saying, well, you could have less reinvestment. And a useful point here to make is that, well, what would that investment be in? So for example, the rolling stock, the trains, uh, you might say the Wi-Fi on the trains, maybe they can buy fewer new trains, whatever that might be. Uh, and so dynamic efficiency falls. And you could also plug on at the end there that consumer surplus would fall. Um, but by P1 AE P2. Um, and so that might be something you could also add on there. And as you, as you see, that, that is just saying that there is an original consumer service there, and the change to the consumer service is that sort of green area there. Fantastic. Right, think about now what you could do in order to evaluate that using the price elasticity of demand of train tickets. What's it likely to be and what's the impact of it? Okay, pause your video and then come back. Right, so the PED of train tickets, this is an opportunity to both use real life examples and also some theory, uh, some technical theory. So we want to first of all define price elasticity of demand. And as we know that the percentage change of the price goes up, that's going to be greater than the percentage fall in quantity demanded if it's inelastic. And if that's the case, then the train companies will pass more of the cost increase to consumers in the form of higher prices. And that's likely to be true in peak times um, where you're on commuter routes. And on commuter routes, we know that there are fewer close substitutes. You can't really, it's very difficult to drive into London. There isn't anywhere to park. Well, it's difficult to find parking and it takes a long time as well and it's congested so therefore it's likely to be far more inelastic whereas you could compare that to prices on rural routes um, lots of more closer substitutes you can get in your car much more easily and therefore um, those prices may rise less and it's more PED elastic and therefore we can make a conclusion there therefore that if it's inelastic it's good for the firm or better for the firm and certainly worse for the consumer and then the other way around if it's elastic it's worse for the firm the profits will go down by more they will have to they will be able to pass on less of the price increase to the consumer and therefore it's better for the consumer um, as a result or it's not as bad as for the consumer as a result Right, let's take a look at our next point, um, and that is the effect on workers. So what is the effect on workers using this point 
up here. This diagram up here. Pause your video and come back when you thought of something. Okay, effective workers, well, you originally have an equilibrium where DL, the demand for labor, is equal to the supply of labor, and at that wage rate, WR, um, Q1 workers are hired, the amount of workers who are willing and able to work is equal to the number of workers that the firm demands. It's really important when you're using one of these diagrams that you recognize that the supply of labor comes from households, from workers, and the demand for labor comes from firms. It's easy to get that mixed up. Now the wage rate as a result of collective bargaining rises to TUWR. I've, I've used TUWR, the trade union bargained wage rate, and it acts very similarly to a minimum wage there. Now as a result of that, you see an extension along the supply of labor. More people now are willing and able to go and work as train drivers. And there's a contraction along the demand for labor curve as the company now is less willing and able to hire workers and indeed will fire some so that um, they save on costs. Therefore, you'll have QSL minus QDL, train drivers who are unemployed, and they'll lose their jobs. And you can see that difference there, uh, highlighted at the bottom there, that, that uh, length along that bottom axis there, that amount there is going to be your number of train drivers who don't have a job. Now, they may well, if they, I suppose, have the skills, they may be able to transfer to other industries, uh, but that's another matter. Now, workers who keep their jobs, however, will enjoy higher wages, and we know that train drivers in the UK uh, can earn up to 50 or more thousand pounds, 50,000 pounds or more. They're generally, for the level of skill, I imagine, uh, paid pretty well. And that's it's in no small part due to the power of the, the collective bargaining of the trade union. Okay, now, tricky argument, coming back to the wage rate elasticity of demand, something that um, I've managed to write that twice, I don't know why. W-R-E-S is what I meant to write. Um, the wage rate elasticity of demand and supply. Think, what, think of what you can get here, what, um, how, what in factors impact that, and what is the result of those. Okay, coming back, well, um, we know that if the wage rate elasticity of demand and supply is inelastic, then the unemployment will be limited or much more or much less than otherwise shown. If we were to draw the diagram again, I wouldn't do that, but you can see that in this instance, both are inelastic and therefore the effect is limited, as you can see. Now that would be the case if the wage rate's inelastic, uh, if labor costs as a percentage of total costs are low. And that's likely to be the case, given that capital costs are high on trains. There's significant uh, cost for buying trains, and the rail network is also very expensive. And therefore, as the labor costs rise, total costs for the train companies are likely to rise by a relatively insignificant amount. We can also say that safety requirements might mean that labor cannot actually be substituted readily for capital or capital cannot be used instead of labor. Um, that means, for example, driverless trains that might not be realizable in the near future. Um, you might also say, I haven't put this down, but uh, the PED that we talked about before, the price elasticity demand for train tickets might mean that one option is to not fire your workers, pay them more, and then just increase the price of the train tickets, which is possible um, as a reasonable uh, solution if you have a PED inelastic demand for train tickets. We could also say that the wage rate elasticity of supply could be inelastic due to significant training requirements um, that we need to make sure that our train drivers are well trained and safe. Now, as an alternative to that, there are two, there's another thing that you could do. You could argue that the MRP, the marginal revenue product of train drivers would go up if they were trained and some of the um, bargaining between trade unions and the companies, the companies might demand that the train drivers become trained or more productive as a result. And if you were to do that, you could then shift this D equals MRP uh, demand curve outwards like that. And then you could show the fact that that wouldn't cause unemployment. Again, if this were a paper three essay, you could actually use a macroeconomic effect and you could show the fact the, sh the effect of uh, lower inequality, the bottoming quintile having higher wages, and the gap falling. And you could then shift the Lorentz curve 
and talk about the change to the Gini coefficient, which would all be evaluated by the fact well, whether unemployment happens. If it does, then the wage rate of the bottom may actually fall, as they may fall into structural unemployment. So that's a, a little aside there if you wanted to do a um, paper three essay on this. On judgment, well, it depends on elasticity, elasticities of all those things that we've talked about. That may not be measurable. Um, they may change over time. Um, they may become more elastic in the future, in the long run. And I think you may ultimately say that while driverless trains in the future may completely remove the power of the trade union in its collective bargaining, in which case the magnitude of the increase in the wage rate is likely to look be lower and lower into the future, and therefore the effects on the firms and the workers will therefore decrease. Okay, I hope that made sense. I hope that was useful. And um, um, do, do make sure that you do some extra research on the train industry as it's a really useful one.